This is my Bible. It is the Word of God, and it is the will of God for my life. I am who the Word says I am. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm where the Word says I am, seated right now in the heavenly realms, in Christ Jesus, in the place of authority, dominion, and power. I have what the Word says I have. All the blessings of Abraham are mine, and I can do what the Word says I can do. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. Today my mind is alert, my spirit is receptive, as I'm taught the Word of God. My life has changed for the better, and I will never be the same again. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We are doing this series, Mastering Money, so that you can come up out of debt, so that you can become well off, so that you can break the spirit of poverty in your life and begin to believe God for bigger and better things. You can stop living a little life. You can tie on to the bigger picture. You can get your life connected to something greater than yourself. Instead of allowing money to master you, you can learn how to master money by tying on to what is closest to the heart of God, and that is God's work, God's mission, and God's house. The reason so many Christians are mastered by money instead of mastering money is they never saw themselves as engines in the work of God. They never saw themselves as paymasters for God's work, God's mission, and God's house. It's hard to believe it's been eight years since I taught on money. Somehow I believe, though, that this week of increase is going to be the week to change all, all of our lives forever financially. I feel led by the Lord to just begin this evening by telling a story. Uh, here a few months back, Austin went to visit a friend of ours in another city, Austin and Aaron. And uh, this young man, when he, uh, actually his father passed away and at a young age, so this young man had to take over that church and ministry. And uh, back in those days, he studied me on television. And uh, I know that because last year we bumped into him at a conference and he recited to me the outline of one of the months of money from years gone by. I mean, he knew the outline. I thought, well, that's interesting. And, uh, but when Austin and Aaron were up there, he asked Austin, you know, what conferences I go to and this and that. And, you know, Austin said, well, he doesn't go anywhere. And uh, I mentioned that to a group of guys a week or two later. And I, mentioned, I said to them, you know, one of the reasons people go places is, in the ministry, is because when you travel, you know, your travel's covered, hotel, your expenses. But I told those guys, I said, you know, I came up out of that level 25 years ago. I mean, one of the reasons you don't see me go anywhere on church business is the whole idea of going somewhere and staying in a Westin and turning it in as an expense is like something that would never even cross my mind. I mean, that's totally, absolutely in the past. And uh, the way we came up out of that was it didn't have anything to do with Faith Christian Center. It had to do with following God. First off, you follow the written word. Amen. Secondly, you follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. But following the leading of the Holy Spirit is not going to do anything unless you follow that written word. Because of the lightning strike we had at the house, we had various electronic things that were killed by the lightning strike. So we ended up having to replace all the thermostats. And so the new thermostats are, you know, different, very uh, full of software. <laughs> and so I've been going days, you know, trying to figure this stuff out. And uh, this morning I woke up hot. And so I, I went from thermostat to thermostat, trying to figure it out in the software, doing this, doing that. 
I texted the guy that installed them. I texted Austin. You know, I couldn't figure it out. And uh, the guy that installed the thermostats called me. He's so nice and gracious. He called me. He told me this. He told me that. I tried this. I tried that. Austin came over, did this, did that. And when it was all said and done, what do you think I did? When I tried everything my little brain knew to do, what do you think I did? I got the book out. Now, there's, a, there's like a cheat sheet shortcut thing that comes with the thermostat. Well, it didn't cover what I was having a problem with. So I had to go into this thicker book, and I'm looking at programming. My answer's not in there. I'm looking at everything I, was, I knew to look at, it wasn't there. So then the thought occurred to me, well, maybe I ought to look at what I would not assume it is. See, if every time you open the Bible, you go to John 3, 16, well, that's why you're not getting traction. There's nothing wrong with John 3, 16, but you just can't keep going to what you know. You got to actually get into the Bible and find some stuff you don't know. Because if you just go to what you know, well, how come you're not advancing faster? The answer to every query is in the Word of God. We just have to get in there and find it. And uh, so anyway, I'm looking, I'm looking through this book now for stuff that would not seem obvious to me. And I come to a page called Sensors. Well, can you believe they have these things programmed so that if you don't walk past them, after so many minutes, it sets it for a way, like you're in Montana or something. <laughs> and I thought, I know we're supposed to save energy. I know everybody's hugging trees, but this is completely stupid. Are you supposed to set your alarm for every 30 minutes at night so you can walk <laughs> past your thermostat? So, I mean, it's just nuts. But that's kind of the, the day we live in. So. When I get into this basic stuff tonight, there's two dangers. One is for you to say, well, I know all that. Well, then you don't get anything out of it. You know, it's uh, August in Texas, which means we are all running our irrigation systems a lot. Either that or you're having a brownout at your house. <laughs> all right? So there are times where the word is a planting but there's nothing wrong with the word being a watering. And the watering is good because the watering refreshes us, keeps us going. Now, I, I realize I had the advantage because I got saved in Sunday school at Bethesda Missionary Temple at Nevada at Van Dyke Avenues in Detroit, Michigan. In 1960, I was five years old. And the very first thing they taught me that I remember after I gave my life to Christ there in Sunday school was tithing. They handed me a little envelope. They had a little Sunday school envelope. They taught me tithing. My allowance was 25 cents a week. I didn't know how to tithe 25 cents a week. So every Sunday I took a nickel and I put a nickel in the envelope. So really, see, I started at 20%, although I wasn't thinking at that level at age five. It was just, I didn't know how to tithe a quarter. So I realized that Sue and I have an advantage. We never had to adjust our budget to a tithe. We never had to reorder our finances to a tithe. We never had to cross the mental bridge to tithe. So I understand that. But if you were not raised that way, if nobody caught you early and taught you, and you have developed a pattern of 5, 10, 15 years, and you resist the written word, well, you're not hurting me, you're not hurting Faith Christian Center, uh, you're hurting yourself, because the answer is in the word of God. I said, the answer is in the Word of God. Amen. John Osteen used to teach, he used to say that if every Christian on the planet was a tither, 
that Christians would control the economic system of the world, Christians would control the banks, Christians would be in charge of the nations, and literally churches and ministries would not know what to do with all the money. And it's not just based on the tithe. It's based on the fact of what would happen to God's people if they would tithe. Because automatically they'd be making two or three times the money. Uh, are you getting this? So we find ourselves in 2018, not, it's worse than being the tail and not the head. We lost our country. I mean, unless the Lord moves in a sovereign, supernatural way and revival sweeps the nation, it's a goner. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that we have not modeled for the world a covenant lifestyle. Actually, the opposite is going on right now. Right now, they're saying sin is okay, drinking's okay, uh, promiscuity's okay, all these alternate lifestyles are okay. So, you know, when people look at church folk versus the world, they don't see any difference anymore. And they ought to see a difference. Amen. Amen. Our children ought not act like Apache Indians. No offense to the Apaches. Uh, you know, uh, we ought not be as broke as the world. Amen. Amen. We ought not drive drunk like the world. Amen. We ought not be as, we ought not be stoned, period, but we ought not be as stoned as the world. Right. In other words, people ought to look at us and say, there is some fruit that I would like to have in my life. Amen. Do you see where I'm headed with this? All right. And so, oh, and how did we break out? Well, it was February of, uh, February of 1993. We were sitting in a restaurant in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We, we were in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma for Winter Bible Seminar 1993. John and Dodie Osteen walked in. Kenneth and Aretha Hagen walked in. I looked at Sue. Sue looked at me. I said, go ahead. And uh, she wrote a check out for $2,500. You'd have to bring that up into $2,018. I have no idea what that would be. But she wrote a check out for $2,500 to uh, Kenneth and Aretha Hagen and took it over there and gave it to them. That was one step of following the Holy Spirit. I had a Harley Davidson that, uh, it, I mean, I saved and saved and saved and saved because no self-respecting word of faith minister can have debt on a Harley Davidson. And so I had this Harley Davidson. Uh, I had the title to it. The Lord told me in the fall challenge offering to give it. And so I liquidated the bike and uh, gave the money, $15,000. And within 45 days, we, I was a millionaire. And it didn't have anything to do with the ministry. Amen. Amen. And then because I'm not idle, I read. Well, I put that money to work. And so tonight, even though when Sue and I got married, we left home with $600 that her grandpa gave us, and I had a 1968 Firebird with no debt on it. Uh, we've given over $4.9 million into the gospel personally. Amen. 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 And so uh, we're not teaching this to make the budget. Amen. We're not teaching this because we're down. No, actually the opposite is the case. I'm a, me being here tonight and doing this, this is a gift. Amen. It's God giving you a gift. Amen. Hallelujah. And what, I, what I'm really doing is say, won't you come and go? Amen. Amen. Come on in, the water's fine. Amen. Amen. You, you don't have to stay, steep, you don't have to keep uh, vacationing at La Quinta and Grand Prairie. Come on now. Amen. Amen. You know, they build cars new. Hallelujah. You know, I'm talking about life after jumper cables, brother. Okay, so we, we were in Isaiah 55. Let's go back there. Isaiah 55, verse 6. Isaiah 55, 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. 
Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. Tell your neighbor, the Lord will have mercy on you. You know, this question comes up on tithing. It's really cute. It's really sweet. When I hear this question, I know I'm dealing with a good heart. But I have people come to me from time to time. They get saved. They say, Pastor, do I owe the Lord a tithe on all that money that I didn't tithe on? It's really sweet because I, whenever I hear that question, I know I'm dealing with a good person here. They got a good heart. I always tell them, I said, well, I always tell them, well, no, I'll tell you what, the Lord now forgive the, forgive the debt. You just pick up and start now. Amen. Yeah, I have the authority to do that. Verse eight, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. You know, uh, one of my beloved church members, he's gone on to be with the Lord, but he would always ask, how's that working out for you? Well, I don't believe in tithing. Uh, how's that working out for you? I, I don't believe in being in church when the doors are open. Well, how's that working out for you? I don't believe in being faithful in marriage. Well, how's that working out for you? You know, how about just doing a checkup of reality? And if, if, you're, if, you, if you're here tonight and you have debt, if you're here tonight and uh, you're not fat financially, well, maybe you ought to open up your mind to new ideas. And what better and what higher idea could we possibly have than a God idea? And that's what the Lord says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. So God's got a higher way. God's got a better way. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. So the word of God going out from the mouth of God is compared to snow and rain. And when the snow and the rain come down upon the earth, it makes the earth bud and flourish. And when the word of God proceeds from the mouth of God and comes into our lives, it makes our lives bud and flourish. It will not return to me empty. Say it out loud. The word of God will not return to God void or empty. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I've sent it. Now notice the word doesn't do anything until it goes forth out of the mouth of God. That's why Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that what? Proceeds from the mouth of God. So the word of God doesn't do anything until it proceeds from God's mouth. And the same is true for you. The word won't do anything for you until it goes forth out of your mouth. So you have to learn how to say what God says. So you've got to meditate on the word to get God's word into your heart so that you can speak it forth. Salvation scriptures will produce salvation. Healing scriptures will produce healing. Miracle scriptures will produce miracles. And prosperity scriptures will produce prosperity. So whatever you need or want in your life, you have got to get the word on it. You've got to meditate on the word, get the word into your heart, and then release that word out of your mouth. The word of God has got to come out of your mouth. The word of God has got to come across your lips. For we know that God's word will not return to him empty or void. God actually takes pleasure in the prosperity of his people. I mean, I, I, I hear some of what is taught and I'm just amazed. Years ago, we got home on a Sunday night after church. It was Easter Sunday and, you know, after church, man, you're just wired up. You can't sleep. So we turned on Christian television. That was our first mistake. And, and then there was a famous uh, pastor here in the Metroplex. Pastor is one of the biggest churches in the Metroplex. And his Easter Sunday morning service was being broadcast Sunday night. And the whole message was about some little girl in the church that had died a horrible death and how that was the will of God and God needed another flower in his garden. And first off, I told Sue, I said, okay, even if he believes that, why would you make that your Easter message? I mean... I only listened to five, six minutes of it, and I was, I was depressed. Well, we had to put in a DVD of a comedy or something just to get over 
the sermon that we had heard. Well, is it any wonder we lost the United States of America if we're telling people God will put cancer on a child when he needs another flower in his garden? Who wants to serve that? I said, who wants to serve that? So we have to renew our mind to the word of God. Look at this, Psalm 35, 27. Psalm 35, 27. Let them shout for joy and be glad that favor my righteous cause. Yea, let them say continually. Say it out loud. Yea, let them say continually. Well, there is an example of saying faith for finances. Let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified, which hath pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. But that's not the culture we live in. A gentleman here this evening asked me yesterday about sharing his financial testimonies in social media. Since he started coming here, the Lord's really been blessing him and he's getting stuff paid off. And, you know, he's just, he's just getting fat financially. And I said, well, we're going to get to it this week, but you got you to you watch that because with the hundredfold, with the blessing comes persecutions. And so you would expect the loss to persecute you for being blessed, but what you wouldn't expect is God's people persecuting you for being blessed. But that's what's out here in social media. Let them shout for joy and be glad. So right off the bat, Christians have a problem because they all look like God just killed their cat. You know, you gotta be glad. You, you can't uh, be looking all morose. Let them shout for joy and be glad. Hallelujah. Death and life are in the power of the tongue and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. So there comes a point where you start getting traction with the word of God. And I mean, you just become giddy. You get stuff paid off. You, got, you get your bills paid. You get cars paid off. Get credit cards paid off. You get your house paid off. I'm telling you what, it brings joy. But is it, is it getting stuff paid off that brings the joy or is it the joy that brings getting stuff paid off? The joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen. If we really believe this stuff, well, we'd be happier. <laughs> You'll get that on the way home. Let them shout for joy and be glad that favor my righteous cause. Yea, let them say continually, what? The Lord takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. Say it out loud. The Lord, the Lord takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. You know, it'd be good for us to take about whatever time we need and say that out loud about a thousand times here tonight. Amen. But we don't have time for that. Say it again. The Lord, the Lord takes, pleasure takes pleasure in the prosperity, the prosperity of, his of his servant. So the word doesn't say God takes pleasure in the, pro in the poverty of his people. The word says the Lord takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. And here in Psalm 35, 27, the Bible is referring to Israel who were the servants of God. But we who live after Christ, who believe in Jesus, are not the servants of God. We are the sons of God. And how many of you know if the Lord took pleasure in the prosperity of his servants, he must surely take, he must surely take pleasure in the prosperity of his sons. If the Lord took pleasure in the prosperity of his servants, how much more does he take pleasure in the prosperity of his sons and his daughters? This is all over the Bible. 2 Corinthians 9, 11 is very familiar to us at Faith Christian Center. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Rich in every way. And we've always taught it that way. It's not just money. Rich in every way. A lot of these people out here in the world, you know, I'm thinking of a movie actor. He made over $650 million. <clears throat> it's all gone. All of his wives hate him. You know, his ex-manager hates him. Studio heads are tired of him. I mean, pardon me, but if I had $650 million cross my hand, I think I'd at least have some of it left. But he hadn't got anything. 
And that's the way a lot of worldly, wealthy people are. All of their wives hate them. All of their children hate them. And they're paying the price in their bodies for taking advantage of people, for not walking in love. See, the, the message of Faith Christian Center is you can have it all, man. You can have a great marriage. You can have, you can have wonderful children. You can have children that don't bring you disgrace. They, 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 they don't end up in jail. I mean, you can, you can literally live your entire life and not have to pay a bail bondsman. You can live your whole life and not need a divorce attorney, not need a custody battle attorney. Amen. Drive the best, wear the best, live in the best, eat the best. Amen. This is the will of God for your life. Every way, not just financially, every way. Over 45 years of preaching the gospel, the number one complaint has been the tithe. Well, I didn't invent the tithe. Tell your neighbor, Pastor Gene didn't invent the tithe. See, God invented the tithe. I'm just telling you what God said. And remember what Isaiah said, Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways, your ways, my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now, I realize people say, well, I don't understand tithing. They don't understand how you can give 10% to God and have more money on the 90% that's left than you would have with the original 100%. And I get it. Tell your neighbor, pastor gets it. I get it. But God says, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. I understand. I understand. But there's a lot in the Bible you, you just can't explain. You can't explain how the anointing of oil works. You can't explain how laying on of hands works. There's a lot in the Bible you just can't explain. You can't get your mind around it. But it's there. What we're going to see this week is the reason God's people are mastered by money is they have a wrong heart. It's about the heart. And it's about stewardship. And it's about trust. Here a couple of, uh, here a couple of Wednesday nights ago, I, I was just totally, absolutely off the chain. I mean, it was probably one of the most crazy, outrageous messages I've ever done in 45 years. I mean, it was so nuts. I went home wondering if we should just delete it off the hard drives. <laughs> Forget about not posting it. Just, you know, disappear it forever. Until the next morning. And I get the report the next morning, and there was almost as much money came in in the offering on a Wednesday night as we took in our entire first year of pioneering this church in 1984. Amen. So what's the diff? Well, I, I would like to think I was a pretty smart guy in 1984, but I, I wouldn't have known how to manage millions of dollars. See, you have to manage thousands before you can manage hundreds of thousands. And you've got to manage hundreds of thousands before you can manage millions. And guess what? If you worked in the world, it'd be the exact same way. You're not going to get hired at a bank tomorrow and then put you in charge of the branch. You're not going to get hired as a stockbroker tomorrow and then give you trading authority for the whole brokerage. You have to prove yourself at level A before you can go to level B. You have to then prove yourself at level B before you can go to level C. Is this or is this not true in the world? Talk to me. Is this or is this not true in the world? Yes. Well, the same thing is true with the Lord. So every blessing, that's why you hear me say, every blessing is a blessing, but every blessing is also a test. And God will send a blessing to you, 
because he wants to bless you, but God will also send a blessing to you to see what you'll do with it. How are you going to handle it? I remember standing at the, up in the restroom at I-30 in our first building. I was washing my hands between services. And there was a guy, he was, uh, he was probably one of the bigger givers back then, but he had just gotten, a, he, was, uh, he had a contracting business in uh, one of the building trades. He had just gotten a great big fat contract, bigger, biggest job he ever had. And he stood there and told me in the restroom while I was washing my hands that the Lord told him, this year, when you do that job, biggest job you ever had, don't tithe on it. Don't bother. And uh, I just dried my hands off and left. I didn't try and help him. Amen. I tried to help a guy in one of these things once, and he's still mad at me. 20-something years later. And, and I got Bible on this. The Bible says, let him who is ignorant be ignorant still. Amen. Because once people decide to believe a lie, you can't help them. I mean, they want to believe a lie. They've decided to believe a lie. They're committed to believe in the lie. So you, we had to be faithful in 84. We had to be faithful in 85. We had to be faithful in 86. See, people come here today. Pastor Sue says, my problem is I make it look easy. People don't realize the 34 and a half years that have gone in ahead of all of this. They don't realize that we had to be faithful at every step. They don't realize how many times the Lord told us to give money away when it didn't make any sense to our natural minds to give money away. I used the illustration yesterday, I think it was last evening, of giving Bud Sickler that $600,000 to put the roof on his church in Mombasa when we needed land, you bring that $600,000 into 2018 dollars, that would be the equivalent in 2018 of 2.2, 2.3 million dollars. That didn't make any sense because we needed land. And anybody that's ever bought land knows you got to put 20% down. Nobody's going to lend you 100% on land. So that didn't make any sense. It didn't make any sense to the natural mind. But when I went over there and did that dedication, April of 2000, if, if the archangel Gabriel himself had told me because we put that $600,000 in another man's dream, in another man's vision, ahead of our own, that just six years hence, to the month, we would move our ministry into a $14 million campus and, and building, I wouldn't have believed it. And I'm a faith guy. See, this is what I know about the Lord that maybe you don't know about the Lord. And that is, if you would just commit, if you would just pull the trigger, if you would just take action, you have no idea where you could be in five years. That's what I know about the Lord that maybe you don't know about the Lord. And so this has given me a wildness. So if the Lord says, do this, I do it. If the Lord says, do that, I do it. I mean, whatever. I mean, instantly. Because I realize that is the ticket. But I also realize that when people start out, they don't know all of that. You have got to get victories under your belt. When, when David went up against Goliath, the key to the whole story is he told those around him, I have killed the lion and I have killed the bear. If he had not killed the lion and if he had not killed the bear, he would not have gone up against Goliath. So you have got to step out in faith. You've got to take action on the word of God and prove it out. Because when you get those victories under your belt, then that gives you crazy faith. And Satan, you know, he might talk a sane person out of it, but he can't talk a crazy man out of it. Amen. Amen. So to master money, you've got to go by God's way of thinking. If you're going to go by your level of thinking, listen to me now. If you're going to go by your level of thinking, you're going to get your level of results. That's worth writing down. If you're going to go by your level of thinking, you're going to get your level of results. 
To master money, you've got to go by God's way of thinking. If you'll go by God's level of thinking, you're going to get God's level of results. Say it out loud. If I'll just go by God's level of thinking, I'll get God's level of results. And so I see guests here this evening, ministry guests, and, you know, uh, they come. And they want to know, they want to know, well, how'd you do this? Well, I tell every one of them the exact same thing, and it's exactly what they don't want to hear. You know how we did this? You want to know? Anybody want to know how we did this? We stood in the same town, and we fearlessly preached the Word of God without apology for 34 and a half years. That's how we did this. But see, everybody wants to know, okay, well, I understand that, you know, I, I give mental assent to what's coming out of your mouth, but that's not the answer I want. I want to know how I can make a confession, or I can use anointing oil, or I can uh, rub a dub a flag, or I can fall out, or how I can uh, drink anointing oil, or whatever I can do so I can shortcut that, and instead of 34 and a half years, how about three and a half years? Well, it doesn't work like that doesn't work like that. And the same thing is true financially. Ha. Ah, thank you for your enthusiasm. You see, that, that's what goes over like a lead balloon. Because what we all want to believe is, I'm going to go to the week of increase, and he's going to tell me a, a certain phrase in tongues, and I'll say it 18 times, and I'll be a millionaire by Friday. Well, that's not the way it works. Amen. You have to prove yourself Amen. at level A, then you go to level B. You prove yourself at level B, then you go to level C, and on and on and on. But the good news is, tell your neighbor, there has to be some good news in here somewhere. <laughs> the good news is there's no limit to how far you can go. Amen. I said there's no limit to how far you can go. Amen. Amen. And then the Lord, you know, the only, the only possible limit is time. And so here a few, a few months back, he, he gave me a verse. He said, now I want you to confess this verse every day from this day to your last day. And he, he gave me the verse to tack on 20 years. I got it. Now, I'm not saying I'll be here 20 years. I don't think we'll be here 20 years. I don't think any of us will be here 20 years. But he gave me the verse to give me 20 more years himself. Well, knowing what I know now, don't you wish to God, I wish I could send a, well, I could send a thumb drive back to 1976, but there were no computers, so what good would that do? <laughs> but don't you wish, I, I wish to God I could send, write a longhand letter to myself, or, or we did have cassette tapes in 1976. I thought this thought, I would love to hang a cassette recorder around my neck and record myself praying what would that be like if I could do that? If I could have recorded myself praying this morning and send that cassette tape back in time. Oh my gosh, where would I be? But see, the Lord leads us beside the still waters. The Lord guides us into the green pastures. So there's no shortcuts. We couldn't even, even if we had a time machine, because... If I could go back in time and tell myself, if you would do this and this and this and this, then you would have, I wouldn't have believed it. That rich man, the story of rich, the rich man and Lazarus, and he wanted somebody to go back and tell his brothers not to, not to die and go to hell, live selfish lives, reject Christ, go to hell. Abraham, Father Abraham said, even, they won't believe even somebody from the dead. Well, we wouldn't believe ourselves coming back from the future. Ask Pastor Sue, if we could go back... What if we could go back in time and take some kind of gizmo and show ourselves a video of our house? Show ourselves a video of this church. How about this? Just show ourselves a video of the garages. <laughs> we wouldn't believe it. The term photoshopped hadn't been invented yet, but we would have said something similar. That's, that's not real. That can't be real. So, you know, I got my notes, but I want to communicate from my heart to your heart 
that you have no idea, eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, what God will do for those who love Amen. Him. Amen. Those who love Him. Those who love Him. Amen. He'll take you further than you ever thought. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor, the Lord will take you further than you ever thought. But it's, it's line upon line, precept upon precept. Proverbs 11, 24, 25, New Living Translation. Give freely and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. The generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. Proverbs eleven twenty five 25, in the King James, the liberal soul shall be made fat. And he that watereth shall be watered also himself. So when it comes to finances, God's ways and God's thoughts are not our ways and not our thoughts. When it comes to finances, God's ways and God's thoughts are higher than our ways and our thoughts. And I'll tell you exactly what it's about. Like that night, February of 1993 in Tulsa, Oklahoma, in that restaurant, and, and the Lord, he didn't speak to us. In other words, I didn't hear verbal instructions. It was an impression. And we must have gotten the impression simultaneously because I looked at Sue and Sue looked at me. Why would God do that? To see what we would do. It's a test to see what we would do. Because if, if you're a greedy little sucker and he gives you an impression to give away 2,500 bucks and, and you say, no, I won't do it. Well, that tells him you're not ready for the next level. Why, why would he run big money through your hands? If he talks to you, gives you an impression to give 2,500 bucks and, and no, no, I'm not. No, no, I, I, I can't spare it. It's a test. First, you follow the written instructions, like me having trouble with that thermostat. When something's wrong, you can't figure it out, you go back to the written instructions. Then after you get done following the written instructions, then you're qualified to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. God's word doesn't do much though until it gets out of his mouth. Likewise, his word won't do you much good until it gets into your heart and out your mouth. So at the end of the day, it's all about the heart. And then you got to say it. What did God say to Joshua? Joshua 1.8, do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. You know, my wife will tell you, man, I mean, I pass these people. My parents were so cheap. Say, how cheap were they, Pastor? How cheap were they? It was a regular occurrence. My, we would, uh, when we would eat with them, my dad would leave a tip. I'm not sure how much he would leave. My mom would wait for him to get up and leave the table, then she'd snatch the tip. When, uh, when I married Sue in 1976, once a year on my birthday, I got, my, my brother-in-law calls it the complimentary C-note. I got a complimentary C-note on my birthday on, at Christmas. I got a complimentary C-note on our wedding anniversary. I got a complimentary C-note, and the dude never heard of inflation. <laughs> he lived through last year, and so December last year, how much do you think I got for my birthday? A complimentary C-note for Christmas, Sue and I. And that's two people, you know? <laughs> what is this, lunch? <laughs> and I'm in the ministry. You know, I don't own like a high-tech company or something. I'm in the ministry, but I passed them both. That's no problem. The blessing of the Lord, Amen. it maketh rich, Amen. and it addeth no sorrow to it. Why don't we say that out loud? The blessing of the Lord, the of the Lord it maketh rich, make rich and addeth no sorrow to it. No In fact, why don't we say that again? The blessing of the Lord, the of the Lord it maketh rich, make rich and addeth no sorrow to it. No to it. Amen. 
Now, now you just can't sit home and watch TV after your eight hours at work and do this because the Lord will lead you. You know, there's guys in the church and they invest in real estate. There's guys in the church and uh, we have one guy, he trades currencies. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna stay as far away from that as I possibly can. I don't even understand that. Uh, there's, there's different ways people invest. So you just can't sit home, you know, put in your eight hours, tithe, watch, and then watch TV for the rest of your life. And, and in other words, you, you're gonna have to read. How about reading? Because most of the wealth that has come to me has come through knowledge. And this is what people like Bernie Sanders don't want to admit. Poor people are poor because they do the things poor people do. And rich people are rich because they do the things rich people do. I mean, you, you never saw a rich guy standing in line at 7-Eleven to buy a lottery ticket. Poor people... Poor people, what do poor people do? Well, they, they buy uh, Colt 45s, isn't that the beer? The, the big, big jug beer? What's that called? You know, they, they, buy, they, buy, uh, they buy wine by the gallon. Rich people don't buy wine by the gallon. <laughs> you know, poor people do what poor people do. And rich people, so it's not really that hard. All you gotta do is stop doing how about this? Babies before marriage? Who does babies before marriage? Talk to me. It's just us Christian folk here tonight, although we'll bounce this off satellites. Who, who, who has babies before marriage? Poor people. And who, who, gets, who, who finishes school before they get married? Rich people. And who waits to, for marriage to have babies? Rich people. So it's not really that hard, even in the natural. My point is, you can't just come to Faith Christian Center and do spiritual truth and, and forget about the natural. And the natural is covered in every Christian's least favorite book of the Bible. It's called Proverbs. And that's why today is the 6th of August, and you should have read the 6th chapter of Proverbs. Tomorrow is the 7th of August, you ought to read the 7th chapter of Proverbs. If you will just do that, you'll double your net worth in 10 years without even lifting a finger to do anything else. Because the practical wisdom of God is in the book of Proverbs. My, my point is, and anybody who's ever listened to me and paid any attention to what I'm saying is, I told somebody this the other day. Most word of faith ministries want, run on one rail. Faith, 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 give, give, give. Faith, faith, faith. Confession, confession, confession. It's all faith. But all of these years, my ministry has run on two rails. Faith and the other rail is character. Because even if you get something by faith, if you don't have good character, you're going to find a way to blow it. Yeah. Am I helping anybody? Yeah. So we got to build that character into our lives and we've got to believe God. And if you do that, well, you're, it's inevitable. Tell your neighbor, it's inevitable. it's inevitable. Anybody can do it. Now, people don't want to believe that. They want to believe you got to be some super duper gifted whatever. No, anybody can do it. I said anybody can do it. Some of the biggest givers in this church used to be drug addicts. You know, when you look at the, some of the biggest givers in this church, some of them never went to college. So it, we're not talking about a congregation of MDs or what brain surgeons. We don't have any of those losing cowboys here tonight, do we? So I'm just saying, I'm just saying regular folk. But Dak's okay. I, I think he's probably a pretty good guy. But he probably needs to find a better team to play for. <laughs> It's all leadership, by the way. The problem's always at the top. If there's a problem, it's at the top. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Say it out loud. The word of God's got to be in my mouth. Meditate on it day and night. Say it out loud. The word of God's got to be in my heart. 
so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. As tell your neighbor, it won't work at all if you don't take action on the Word of God. So I've got to get it in my heart. I've got to get it coming out of my mouth. And then I've got to be faithful in taking action thereon. God says, so is my word that goes out from my mouth that will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. So let me ask you, is there any word going out of your mouth? Is there any word going out of your mouth? You need to have the word of God in your heart and you need to have the word of God in your mouth. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the pur purpose for which I sent it. If you study the life of Jesus, he did not talk for no reason. Every word proceeding from the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ was like a polished arrow and it had a purpose. God has a purpose for every promise and every revelation in the Bible. For example, in Psalm 102, verse 7, it says, God has sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. God has sent his word. God sent healing scriptures so that people can be healed. God sent salvation scriptures so that people could be saved. And God sent financial and prosperity promises and revelations so that we might prosper financially. But you've got to get the promises of God into your heart and you've got to get them coming up out of your mouth mouth. They have to become a part of your regular vocabulary. And that's one of the things that I think causes people to have to get used to me because I don't play preacher games. And so people have to get used to me. You know, how's it going, pastor? Well, I'm blessed coming in, blessed going out. In other words, and I have a good friend in the ministry and I just choose to ignore it. But if you, if you send him a blessing, you get this, oh, man, that could not have come at a more critical time in our lives. See, I'm not going to do that. Yeah, I'm going to take your money and I'm going to put it on top of this great big pallet of cash we got over here. <laughs> But I'm not going to stay. I'm, I'm, I mean, no one has ever heard anything like that come out of my mouth. Oh, thank you, brother. That, that, came, at a, that came at a very critical time. And, and why, why did they do that Richard Nixon thing when they do that? It's a game. And I'm not playing. I'm not playing it. You know, how you doing, Pastor? Man, I'm doing great. Man, never been richer, never been happier, never been more in love with Sue. It's all great. It's all fabulous. Amen. Church has never had more money. Oh, man, it's just going great. And that, that offends people because they have their last 15 pastors played the <laughs> Richard Nixon game with them. You know, and I'm not doing it. I will not dishonor my Lord that way. Amen. So you got to get the word of God in your heart. You got to get the word of God coming out of your mouth. So my point is you can't be playing politics. Now we have to be careful. You know, if somebody in the world, I've got places we shop at in Dallas on occasion, and, and they may say, how's it going? I say, it's going great. That's it. That's enough. It's going great. Don't, you know what I'm saying? So you're talking to the world now. You're not talking to a brother, you're talking to the world. It's going great. And, and you know how relatives are. So you got to really be careful at Thanksgiving and Christmas and all that. Because if you tell them too much, they get mad. Amen. I mean, my son went round and round with his grandpa last May. You know, we get there for my niece's wedding. And, uh, you know, my, my father-in-law, he's relentless. He said, uh, said to Austin, he said, how'd you get here? We flew. Did you fly American? No. Did you fly Delta? No. Well, how'd you get here? We flew. I 
I'm just saying, you, you can't be casting your pearls just out everywhere because you don't really know what you're dealing with at any given point in time. You don't want to be telling your business every which way. So sometimes you just say, well, you know, it's going great and let it go. Because not everybody's for you. Have you figured this out? Yes. Tell your neighbor, not everybody's for you. I could count on one hand the people that I could speak honestly about the blessings of the Lord. Because people just can't handle it. I remember somebody some way, some way found out up when we were up at I-30, some way they found out that a billboard the church had rented was $1,700 a month. And they, they, they lost their mind. <laughs> they lost their mind. I mean, you would have thought they had Tourette syndrome. <laughs> they lost their mind because people don't know what stuff costs. They, they have no idea what stuff costs. If I just told you what the electric bill was here, you, you'd... We, we would think you were slain by the spirit. <laughs> People just don't know what stuff costs. And so they can't handle information. Amen. Amen. And you don't know what, you know, now we're getting it all paid off, but you don't know what the pay, you don't want to know what the payment was. You have never heard me say what the payment was. Because I don't want heart attacks in services. <laughs> We're getting it all paid off. Amen. Amen. But people can't handle you talking about the blessing in your life. So you got to keep, we dealt with that two Sundays ago. You got to keep your circle small. Isaiah 119 said, God, God said, if you're willing and obedient, God said, I'll make you rich. Say it out loud. Tell, tell your neighbor, God wants to make you rich. Tell the neighbor on the other side, God wants to make you rich. Hey, how about all you married women, look your husband right in the eye and tell him, you know, rather than telling him what he can't do, how about looking your husband right in the eye and telling him, God wants to make you rich. Right. And what does rich mean? Well, that you have more than you need all the time. Amen. If you are willing and obedient, Isaiah 119, if you are willing and obedient, you will eat the best from the lamb. But if you resist and rebel, you'll be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken. Now, we love the first phrase. We love verse 19. In fact, a lot of people quote this, verse 19 only. If you're willing and obedient, you will eat the best from the land. Isn't that great? Isn't that wonderful? But wait a minute. That's not the end of the sentence. The next clause in verse 20 says, but if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. You'll be devoured. And so we've got a whole country full of people that walk the aisle. They, they, they made Jesus Christ their Lord and their Savior. And they've resisted God on the written word when it comes to money. And money, we're going to deal with this in the next two or three nights. Money is the easiest thing to hear God on. Now, why that is, I don't know. Money is the easiest thing to hear God on. I don't, I don't know why that is. But it's easier to hear God on money than on anything else. And people resist. And they're being devoured. They're being devoured. And it shows up. See, it's like, it's like a, a meteor hitting the ocean. It, it shows up all over the place because they're being devoured. They're not a blessing to their children. And what, because they're Christian people, you know, well, we love the Lord, you know, uh, I'm a friend of God, they sing and all of that. And, 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 and their children just can't wait to turn 18 and get the heck out of there and leave skid marks. I think it's really great. My daughter is, I don't know, 30 something years old. And uh, she's coming to see us all the time coming to see us all the time. Amen. Amen. So 
not having enough reverberates out into other areas. It, it, it damages our testimony to the world. It, it causes our children to think that they don't want anything to do with Christianity. And you know, you know the people who pay the biggest price are preacher's kids because they saw mom and dad uh, kowtowing to church folk and breaking their word to their kids because of church events and preaching the word of God, but the children not having enough. I mean, some of the most rebellious, immoral, atheist people in America today were raised in Christian homes of ministers. See, God wants you to have enough, brothers and sisters, to where your needs are met, your bills are paid, and, and you can be a blessing to your children. Amen. Amen. We got school starting here in a few weeks. Kids need bigger shoes every year. Their feet are growing. And, uh, you know, pants and shirts. So being a blessing, seeing it's a heart thing, it's an attitude, it's a spirit. I'm, I'm, I'm obedient to God. I give to God. I tithe to God. But I, I'm a blessing. I'm a blessing to my wife. Hopefully she thinks I am. Uh, I'm a blessing to my children. Hopefully they think I am. Amen. Amen. People who come to the house and work for me, you know, we give them extra on occasion. I want to be a blessing to them. When I'm in a restaurant, I always give 15%. Sometimes I just got to grin and bear it and give them 15%. I think, you know, you, you ought to be paying me to sit here and take this bad service. But I give them 15% because they, my name's on the credit card. They can look me up. I give them 15%. I don't give them a track. I don't leave a copy of God's very own child and I give them a tip. See, you, it's a hard thing. You got to believe that God is great enough. God is powerful enough that he will bless your life and make it all up to you. Amen. See, what was the very first promise? I think that's Genesis 12, 1. God said, Abraham, I will bless you and I will make you a blessing. And everybody's singing about how that, you know, they got the blessing of Abraham, but they're not living like Abraham. When, when Sarah died and the king wanted to give Abraham a place to bury her, Abraham refused. He demanded that he pay for the burial plot and that he pay full price. But Christians wouldn't be doing that. You know, they would be uh, looking for a discount. So God wants to bless you but God doesn't just want to bless you because you're his son and your daughter. God wants to bless you so you can be a blessing. At the end of the day, it is a kind of walking in love that people have missed. I have to do this. It's a hard thing. And I've got to do this to prove out to myself that this God that I'm speaking about this evening, he is alive. He is real. He is operating in my life. And so if he tells me to, to do something, he'll just make it up to us. Amen. And you see this all the time. You may not analyze it, but you see it all the time. I mean, Tiff Shuttlesworth came through because, not because he was scheduled to be here. He had a meeting in Houston. They got, the church got flooded. So he came up here to hear me and Austin speak. I find out that he's doing a crusade in Pakistan. Who in the world's doing a crusade in Pakistan? So my first thought was, man, I got I to gotta have me a piece of that. Man, I got to get in on that. And so I just opened up the doors on Sunday morning. And then we mentioned it again Wednesday night. $15,000 came in. We sent it $15,000. See? And, and somebody might say, well, how can you do that? The guy didn't even speak. Well, because I don't believe I'm diminished. See, if, if I believe I'm diminished, well, then I got to hang on. But if I don't believe I'm diminished, I can just be crazy. And this God I'm serving, he just makes it up to me. Amen. Amen. 
You know, I, I don't even know. I, I won't know until tomorrow. I mean, it's a crazy number. I don't know, 700,000, I don't know what it is that we have prepaid on this property since Easter. It's a crazy number. It's a crazy number. And so I'm, what I'm having them do is we can only make those prepayments so many times a year. I'm having them cut the check in the last day of the month every month because I don't want to think that money's there and then it's not. So in real time, that money's gone in the accounting. And Satan, see, the world's thinking would be, oh, you're going to go backwards. Man, you better hang on to some of that. No, I told the people that the money was going to pay off the building. So I can't hold part of it back. I've got to make my word good. I've got to do what I said. And so at the end of every month, you know, I'm looking at the numbers and I'm thinking, wow. And I ask every month, did we make the prepayment? Yes. Now, why would I ask every month, did we make the prepayment? Because we're so far in the black. I'm the man of God here and I can't hardly believe it. I'm a faith guy and I can't hardly believe it. Are you listening to me? And so when these missionaries come through or somebody's doing it, I, of course, yes, give. Tomorrow when I show up at the office, we're going to expand our Friday giving to the poor list. We're going to expand it to people that are, their main thing is just winning people to Christ. I'm, I'm looking for more ways to give. I'm not looking for less ways to give. Why? Because I see that the, the, that the more we give away, the more we have left. John Templeton was born a poor kid in Tennessee, and he, he became one of the richest men in the world. And that's something he wrote in the New York Times. The more we give away, the more money we have left. So this is the heart of God. But God's people don't want to go along with the program. So God can't bless them the way he wants to bless them. And the work of God suffers. John Osteen used to say that if every Christian on the planet would tithe, that the church would control the world's economy, the church would control the banks, and literally pastors and ministers wouldn't know what to do with all the money. Not just because of the tithe coming in, but because of the blessing of the Lord that would be coming upon the people. Yeah. But if you resist you'll be devoured. If you resist, you'll be devoured. And people don't seem like they can connect the dots. You know, I'm being devoured. Uh, you know, I've been a Christian 25 years. Okay, what's your net worth? Uh, $25. So you traded, you traded, you traded 52 weeks of labor for a dollar a year. And one day you're going to stand before the Lord. I don't care who you are. You're going to stand before the Lord and the Lord's going to say, what did you do with what I put in your hand? The 75% of everybody in America doesn't have $10,000 to their name. How can that be? How can that be? If you resist, Isaiah says, you'll be devoured. Austin used that illustration in the offering. I think that was last evening, Cain and Abel. And God said to Cain, sin is crouching at your door and it seeks to master you. But you must master it. That's what we're teaching this week on mastering money. Sin is crouching at your door and it seeks to master you. And money is just one of those things that can, it's like porn. That when it gets a hold of a man's heart, it's hard to get it rooted out. And it's not money that's the root of all evil. If you'll actually look at what Paul wrote, it's not money, it's the love of money. And it's not the rich that love money. You could have $10 and love money. You could have $10 million and love money. You could have $10 and not love money, or you could have $10 million and not love money. It's not about the money. That's what this whole thing is about. It's not about the money. It's about the heart. It's about the heart. 
And that's why God designed the system of the tithe was not just to see what was in your heart, but it's his plan, his system to get money to you. If you plant pumpkin seeds, you reap pumpkins. What do pumpkins have on the inside of them? More seeds. Everything produces after its own kind. And the seed has no power released until you put it in the earth. It has potentiality. The seed knows what to do. The seed knows its business. But the potentiality of the seed is not released until it gets put into the ground. And the ground doesn't care if you're white or black or whether you were born in America or not, or whether you're male or female, or whether you're young or old. The earth will produce. So God designed a system whereby, I mean, this is how we live. Most people today, and you know, God forbid, God forbid that, that there be some EMP blast or that, uh, you know, that uh, depression hits or whatever, because people think food comes from grocery stores. They have no idea. And this whole thing of uh, gender being a, a cultural phenom, I mean, people are just like unbelievably stupid. You know how people used to get rich? You got a job, you saved up enough money, and you bought a cow and you bought a bull. And the rest is history. But if the bull was confused about its gender identity, well, you're, you're just, you just stay poor. And if you have two cows, guess what? Nothing happens. And I'm not trying to be vulgar. I'm not trying to be vulgar. I'm trying to teach the system God designed in the world. What is the cow? What is the bull put in the cow? A seed. And then every so many offspring, you get another bull. And what's the bull got inside him, built inside him? Seed. Everything produces after its own kind. Nobody here ever got married. You went on your honeymoon, and nine months later, a dolphin was born. <laughs> Everything produces after its own kind. And the seed knows its business. Amen. See, I'm talking about mastering money. Money shall not master me. I shall master money. Say it out loud. Money shall not master me. I shall master money. I mean, it's really no different than a pumpkin seed. Jessica's planted pumpkin seeds. Now she's got pumpkins coming up. Isn't it amazing? Is they're not onions. We, they don't stand out there. The children don't stand out there and say, oh my gosh, they're pumpkins. They're not onions. No. Only the world does that. Unsaved people do that. Baby's born. I wonder what it is. Well, in my day, we knew what it was. You look, you know what it is. That's how you do in a garden. That's an onion. That's a pumpkin. That's a cabbage. That's a carrot. Right? So God designed all of this like he designed the seed in the ground, like he designed cows and bulls, like he designed mares and stallions, like he designed money. He designed all of this to feed and to make wealthy his sons and his daughters. But they don't work it. They don't work it. They don't work it. And they don't look to Father God as their source. Now they look to government as their source. And if you haven't figured out, the United States government is the brokest organization in the entire world. $68 trillion, Forbes magazine says. The government says they owe $22 trillion. Forbes magazine says that with the unfunded liabilities, it's more like $68 trillion. We cannot grow ourselves out of it. There's not enough money in the entire world to pay the debt of the United States government. You may as well look to your crackhead brother-in-law as your source than the United <laughs> States of America. 
In fact, if you actually understood economics, you would, you would double down on God and tithing and faith and all of that so you could eat later when the whole system comes down. Amen. Because when, when the end of money comes, and I don't know when that is, I'm believing it's going to be the day after the rapture. But when the end of money comes, guess what? You're going to have to learn how to walk by faith. But the problem is you're going to have trouble doing it in an emergency situation. So the better thing is to learn how to walk by faith now. You'll be made rich in every way, not just money. Abraham is our father in the faith, isn't he? Genesis 13, 2 tells us that Abraham became very rich in gold and silver and cattle. Without the New Testament, without Jesus, without the Holy Spirit, in fact, he didn't even have the Mosaic law. Genesis 24, 1, Abraham was now old and well advanced in years and the Lord had blessed him in every way. Somebody say every way. So this is not just in the New Testament. It's in the Old Testament. It's not just in the Old Testament. It's in the New Testament. God, the King James says, the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Since Abraham is our father in the faith, our spiritual father, we ought to follow his example and live out what he lived out. Isaac sowed in the midst of famine and reaped a hundredfold. Jacob left home with nothing but a staff in his hand and years later returned home a rich man. Solomon was the richest man who ever lived. There was so much gold in Solomon's day, they stopped keeping track of silver. So we're taking this week to talk about mastering money so faith will be produced in your heart to believe God for more, to produce more in your life. Jesus said in Luke 6, 38, given it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall be poured into your lap for with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Jesus said in Matthew 17, 20, if you have faith as a seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Dr. Fred Price taught us to read into the Bible, not just what does the Bible say, what does the Bible not say? Turn the coin over. Jesus said, if you have faith as a seed, you can say to the mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. What did he not say? If you don't have faith as a seed, you can do all the talking to the mountain you want, and the mountain's not going to move. If God is your source, and if you have seed in the ground, seed faith, you'll have mountain moving, nothing impossible faith, and you'll be able to say to the mountain, move and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Don't live the rest of your days in the same financial position you're in today. Don't stay where you are. There is more, and God wants you to have more. Too many of God's people are bound by a spirit of poverty. Imagine the greatest economy the world has ever known. I'm not talking about Trump's economy. I'm talking about the economy since the Industrial Revolution. You understand, there was no way if you were born poor or born in slavery, there was no way before the Industrial Revolution to become wealthy except maybe in uh, military service, depending on the country, depending on the way they paid you, there was no way to break up out. But since the Industrial Revolution, there has come this thing called the middle class. Anybody can rise up, anybody can come up. But imagine, the greatest economy the world's ever known, the richest economy the world's ever known, and the vast majority of God's people in the United States of America don't have two nickels to rub together. He says, if you resist and rebel, you'll be devoured. Malachi 3, I, the Lord, verse 6, I, the Lord, do not change. So you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not cast their fruit, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Lord Almighty. So God said to the people, return to me and I will return to you. And the people said, how are we to return? And God starts talking about money. 
Why? 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 Because this is the heart of mastering money. Why did God immediately start talking about money? In the context of his people returning to him from their backslidden condition. And I want you to notice that not following the Lord's instructions in tithes and offerings is equated with a backslidden condition. Because it's about the heart. We follow our money. That's why you married women have a high and holy duty to get your husband to spend money on you. Because our hearts follow our money. I mean, we had a guy back at I-30. I mean, he was just the cheapest guy in the world with his wife. I mean, man, the, the ch children, I mean, they were hardly dressed. I mean, it was just pitiful. You know, man. And, and, you know, men always looking for some new hot thing. Well, if you got that woman at work to go out with you and you divorced your wife and that hot thing at work married you, she'd look like your wife in five years. Because people, all of us need maintenance. Hair, nails, makeup. And you can't do this on $5. Hair, nails, makeup, and that, that's before you get to clothing. 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 And I love our Faith Christian t-shirts, but you know, uh, a Faith Christian t-shirt and a pair of blue jeans and shoes from five years ago, a date will not entice. I'm talking about single people. Are you married people? Have at it. <laughs> we follow our money. Jesus said, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And so in the context of returning to God from their backslidden condition, God begins to talk to them about tithes and offerings. God says, the way you return to me is to get your heart right on money. If, you're, if a man's heart is not right on money, that man's heart is not right. That guy all those years ago, man, he was so tight with his family. He, he got a girlfriend at work. Oh, man, he took her to Disney World. His own family had not been to Disney World. He took that woman to Disney World. I mean, he racked up all kinds of debt. And then come to find out it was on his wife's credit card. And when they, when they got divorced, the judge said, well, that's your credit card. That's your debt. So that's yours. So she walked away from the divorce with his trip to Disney World with his girlfriend on her credit card. I'm just surprised there aren't more murders. <laughs> so God begins to talk to them. How do you come back? How do you come back from your backslidden condition? Well, tithes and offerings. You'll never really be right with God and return to God so long as you rob God, steal from God, and are stingy, and you won't honor what God says in his word. You know... I'm hopelessly behind in these notes, so what difference does it make? <laughs> you got to get your heart right. I remember one year, you know, I was younger, and, uh, you know, we were busy, pressure. And I took Sue to uh, Dallas to eat at our favorite restaurant. And when lunch was over, we walked about a block down the street to uh, a designer store. And, uh, you know, you know how designer stuff is. 90% of it's weird. <laughs> but there was, man, there was a dress. I mean, man, it was a stunner. And, uh, you know, in a, in, a de in a designer store like that, you know, it's pretty cool. The husband can sit in there, you know, and watch his wife change clothes. I'm talking about husband-wife stuff. Now, we got guys doing jumping jacks naked in women's rooms at McDonald's. <laughs> well, this is, a, this is a different level of prosperity than that. <laughs> so anyway, she, we, I mean, there was this one dress. It was a suit, actually, a suit. Man, it was a total knockout. And... Uh, so I went over there. I said, yeah, I get it. Well have, well, have you looked at the price? No, I don't want to look at the price. <laughs> I went over there, and I put my left hand over 
the bottom of the ticket and sign my name. I didn't want to look at it. See, I didn't want my mind interfering. I stuck the receipt in my wallet, got home, then I looked. <laughs> but your heart follows your money. Are, are any of you guys listening to me? Your heart follows your money. And how about people being cheap with their children? What kind of heart is that? Oh, I, I know, I know, I know they got drag queens over here lecturing at the Arlington high schools, but you know, uh, you know, man, I mean, I got to have me the latest, greatest, you know, Cadillac, platinum, you know, whatever, you know, man, I mean, so, you know, here, you just go over here and let this drag queen lecture you and, uh, and I'm going to go get me my new SUV. Well, that's how you end up not having grandchildren. Because if they don't know if they're a, 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 a heifer or a bull, <laughs> you, can feed your, you can feed your Cadillac ice cream cones because you won't have any grandchildren. Confusion. If a man's heart isn't right on money, that man's heart is not right. And that man's heart is away from God, cut off, separated from God. Jesus said, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If your treasure, your heart, your money is not in God's kingdom, your heart is not in God's kingdom. Now, we're not talking about buying God's favor. We're talking about having a right heart toward God, honoring God. The people said, how are we to return? And God starts talking about money. God starts talking about tithes and offerings. It's very difficult to backslide so long as you are tithing to God. It's nearly impossible to backslide tithing. So long as people are tithing, they're in church. Why? Because they, they follow their money. And if their tithe is in the local church, the storehouse, they follow their money. They want, to, they want to show up on Sunday and make sure that Dr. Gene hasn't changed. They want to show, make sure the message is the same. They want to make sure the place is being maintained. They want to make sure that the, the grass is mowed, that it all looks like my money's being used wisely. They're, they follow their money. And when people decide to backslide, that's why their money leaves before their physical bodies leave. Because they know, their heart knows they're on their way out. Well, why put more money in? So they stop giving then because their money is not in the church. They don't follow their money to church. Then they lay out. Then they, they stop giving. They lay out. Then they backslide. It's easier. But the first thing to stop is the money. The second thing to stop is the attendance. People follow their money. When people do backslide, they stop giving, they stop attending. You get closer to God when you handle your money right, and you get further from God when you handle your money wrong. You'll never rise up financially and get all your needs met financially and get to the place where every seven days you have money left over to invest and money left over to be generous on every occasion until you get to thinking God's thoughts about money. Isaiah 55, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. I've got to stop thinking mom and dad's thoughts about money. I got to stop doing what mom did, stop doing what dad did. I got to stop it. I got, I've, got to, I've got to embrace a higher dimension in my thinking. Amen. To operate at a higher level, I've got to embrace a higher level of thinking. Amen. Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. The Bible says the tithe is the Lord's. A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. In fact, everything you have belongs to God. Say it out loud, Father, everything I have came from you. 
So as a steward over what you've given me, what do you want me to do? There's great power released saying, Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do. He says, set aside a dime out of every dollar I give you and give that to the local church, the storehouse, so that the word can be preached in the local church. And then I want you to obey me when I talk to you about offerings. And if you're a good steward, God will soon give you more and more and more. Jesus said, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. If you're not faithful in the little things God gives you, he won't give you more. And, you know, don't be arrogant. There are people, and they do, you know, they'll, they'll tie their regular income to the storehouse, the local church, but when they, something big comes across their hands, well, you know, they, I, I, gotta, I, I gotta do something special with this tithe because, you know, the local church can't handle this tithe. You fool. How do you know the Lord won't require your life tonight? If you haven't figured it out, we can handle whatever you can cough up. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Each building's at least $10 million. Well, you know, this is special money. Well, you want some more? You want some more special money? Even my father in the faith, Oral Roberts, who was head of one of the largest parachurch ministries in America taught the tithe goes to the local church, the storehouse where you go on the Lord's day to be taught the word of God. That's where the tithe goes. And if you have special money, cross your hands. Well, do you want any more? The Lord says, test me in this. Prove me, test me. So basically God is daring you to try him out. God wants to lift the curse off your life. And as someone with 45 years experience teaching and preaching God's word, I would say it doesn't matter what you believe. The only thing that matters is what has God said. If you're not putting God first financially, the money you earn, you're putting into pockets with holes in them. You're putting into a purse with holes in it. I believe God has decided to bless the congregation of Faith Christian Center. The ones who can receive it will receive it. The ones who have faith will receive it. The ones who take action on the word of God will receive it. I believe it's a new day. I believe this is a new phase. I believe God wants to lift up this church as an example to the rest of the church in America. I believe God wants to use us almost like a laboratory experiment to prove to other churches across the land that the word works if we'll just work the word. And they said harsh things about God. Look at verse 13. You have said harsh things against me, says the Lord. Yet you ask, what have we said against you? You have said it is futile to serve God. And you don't want your children coming to that conclusion. What do we gain by carrying out his requirements and going about like mourners? Well, that's half your problem. You know, if you're not glad when you tithe, you got a problem. A lady came up to me just Sunday, just, just, just yesterday, uh, a black lady, single lady. She said, she, she was weeping. She said, Pastor Gina, so I'm so grateful for the word of God here. She said, I just tithe more than I've ever tithed in my entire life. I said, isn't it wonderful? I said, we'll believe God with you that you'll be tithing twice that shortly. I told her, when you get your mind right about tithing, you love the big tithe. Because the bigger the tithe, the more you got left. Yeah. Amen. I mean, there is something sweeter than tithing $1,000, and that's tithing $10,000. And there's something sweeter than tithing $10,000, and that's tithing $100,000. Amen. When you get your mind right. Verse 15, but now we call the arrogant blessed, certainly evildoers prosper, and even those who challenge God escape. You get to talking like this, God will judge you. It's dangerous. I said it's dangerous. It does pay to serve God. We even see that in the New Testament. 
He says, you will again see the distinction, verse 18, between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. So let us honor God with our money. Jesus said, whoever can be trusted with very little will also be trusted with much, and whoever is dishonest with little will also be dishonest with much. God has got a plan to prosper you. I said, God has got a plan to prosper you. I mean, my grandfather was a farmer. He, the thought would never have occurred to him to not plant. The thought would never have occurred to him to quarantine the bull. I mean, a farmer, a real farmer would never say something like, I don't believe that. They know how it works. And he says, test me. He says, prove me. Now I realize on a Monday night, I'm talking probably primarily to tithers. I understand this. But we have to have the word rehearsed to us over and over and over to where it becomes ingrained in our thinking. And, and the problem is, frankly, we get content with a level. And what I'm telling you is, in 2018, 2019, 2020, there is a higher level coming. Amen. That's what I'm saying. Amen. You have not tapped out, well, you may have tapped out your potential, but you have not tapped out the Lord's potential. Amen. There's no limit. I said there's no limit. I've never had anybody put a check for $400,000 in my hand personally. That was a new experience. And the Lord said, double tithe it. So I, I obeyed him. I double tithe it. Well, guess what I'm looking for now? $500,000. A million dollars. Amen. Why not? I said, why not? Well, you know, who could do that? Well, somebody who's got it. Somebody who's got it. Somebody who's got it. Somebody, in fact, that wasn't all they had. Because if it was all they had, they wouldn't have given it. Do you understand? In other words, they had so much, they could part with that. God wants you to have that much and more. Amen. Amen. And he can do it just by giving you an idea. It doesn't have to be by you working overtime. I mean, you can only make so much money working overtime. It could be an idea. Amen. God is not limited by what you can do. His thoughts are higher than your thoughts. His ways are higher than your ways. I did a series of messages I did two series of messages at I-30 that transformed this church and empowered us to make the jump from I-30 to this property. And one of those series, one of the message in one of those series was the six-figure man. And I had a guy come up to me after. He said, Pastor, when are you going to do a message called the seven-figure man? And I was very polite. I didn't think anything of it. I mean, I didn't say anything about it, but I thought, well, you know, I don't think I'm dealing with a right heart here. But I thought to myself, I will produce that. In fact, I thought to myself, I'll produce that. And yes, I mean, I know you'd be shocked, but we've got, we've got men in this church and they make that every year. Every year. I'm not talking about a big year in the stock market. I'm saying there are men in this. Now, I'm not going to tell you who they are. Because you'll try and sell them a, a, a cruise out of Galveston or something. I'm just saying there are men in, at Faith Christian Center, and they make that every year. Say it out loud. What one man can do, another man can do. Say it again. What one man can do another man can do. 
Well, Pastor, I just don't, I just don't think that's necessary because, you know, in just 89 more payments, I'm going to have my double wide paid off. And, uh, and then we're thinking about trading that in on a Winnebago and, and we, we're, we're going to go and uh, we're going we're gonna to tool around New Mexico in the winter. Well, if that's your vision for, for life, you know, go for it. I rode my Harley past all those trailer parks down there in southern New Mexico. Oh, my God. That's no vision. I said, that's no vision. I used to stop for gas on a Harley and, and see those old people and those old Winnebago's and, and they had bumper stickers. I'm spending my children's inheritance. I thought you unsaved, going to hell, lost person. Now, I got a vision. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I got a vision that, that I can give myself a million dollars in one year. I've got a vision I've got a vision for Faith Christian Center giving a million dollars away each and every year, not just an occasional million every year, and then go to two million and three million, four million, five million, six million, seven million. I'd like to get to 10 million a year, every year, going out the door to win the lost, to, to minister to the poor, to help kids get out of public school and be in St. Paul's. Amen. There's no limit to it. There's no limit to it. The only limit is between your ears, because whatever you can believe God for, he'll do. Amen. I wish I could take all of you to drive by 4084 Merida in Fort Worth. That's where we lived. It was $84 a month. We got married and I made $5,000 and change working part-time while I was working on my master's degree, Sue made $5,000 $5, and change working full-time. She worked at Paxton Lumber Company. Then she was going to school part-time at TCU. But we were tithing. We were tithing. A lot of those seminary students we were in school with, they weren't tithing. They couldn't afford to tithe. But we were tithing. We, we were tithing. And if you'll tithe, and then you'll mix your faith with it. There are people here tonight and you're tithing, you're faithful, but you haven't mixed your faith with it. You got to mix your faith with it. You got to believe God. You got to lift up your eyes. Get that message from last night. Rehearse it over and over and over. You've got to learn how to use your faith and pull miracles into the now. Don't, don't, don't be shoving everything off into the future. My father, which art in heaven, give me this day. My Father, which art in heaven, we covered that last night. Give me this day and pull those miracles into the now. Hallelujah. And same thing on healing. Same thing on healing. Believe it now. Believe you receive it now. I believe I receive it now. Pull it into the now. Amen. So start. Take action. If you've made a challenge offering commitment, don't wait until you have all the money to put the money in the offering. Satan will see to it. You'll never have all the money. You got to start. You got to take action because God has promised to bless all the work of your hands. If you will keep the money going out, God will keep the money coming in. Yes. Say it out loud. If I'll keep the money going out, God will keep the money coming in. And when you have everything right between you and God financially, you are on good, solid ground to believe God in other areas of life as well. And you'll be able to stand up against the devil and run him out of your life and run him out of your body. I believe we are going to be the healthiest and the wealthiest congregation in the Metroplex. I believe that. I believe the days of prosperity are ahead of us. I believe God is setting us up right now in this week of increase to have more than we have ever imagined possible. Can I get an amen? Can I get a better amen? Hallelujah. And it's all the word. You go to the father, you have something on your mind and your heart, he'll give you word on it. Then you got to get that word in your heart. You got to get that word coming out of your mouth. I love you. I bless you. I pray in Jesus name. He'd make you rich.